Sam Goldberg, ever since he was a kid, grew up into generational wealth. Both of his parents were extremely wealthy and his entire family in general were extremely wealthy. He had uncles and aunts that were police officers, firefighters, lawyers. So all of Sam's life, he grew up around money and always having the feeling of being taken care of. But that doesn't mean that his parents taught him to sit around and do nothing. Sam's parents had taught Sam the importance of doing things on your own and working hard for yourself. And so that is when Sam would actually get his very first job at NBC, where he worked there as a TV producer for seven years. And shortly after graduating high school, entering into college, that's when Sam would meet his future wife, Ellen Greenberg. Ellen Greenberg was born on June 23rd, 1983, to her dad, Josh, and her mom, Sandy, where she grew up in northern New Jersey as an only child. And as a child, Ellen was described as very bubbly and fun, and she was super outgoing. She was always trying to make new friends at school and in middle school is when her and her parents moved to Harrisburg, New York. And that's where she attended the Susquehanna Township High School. You've just seen a brief glimpse of the dreams of the Hannah Education Foundation. I'm Ellen Greenberg, a Susquehanna Township student and a board member of the Hannah Education Foundation. How do you build a dream? What foundations do you build it on? In its brief history, the Hannah Education Foundation has inspired many dreams, and it hopes to implement many more. And as you can see, Ellen was a very mature girl for her age. Not only was Ellen gorgeous, she was also the type of pretty girl that was nice to everyone she met. She had a contagious smile and a contagious laugh and could just be friends with anyone. Ellen was also described as very smart and sophisticated for her age. She was head of the school's council and got really good grades, as well as doing sports such as softball and golf. And then after high school into college, she got accepted into Penn State University, where she would later major in communications. And even in college, a lot of people would describe Ellen as the same exact way. She was very bubbly and outgoing. She would attend all of the college's sports games. And every time she went, she was the one that always brought the school spirit. She was also on her college's golf team as well. And she also did a couple other things for her college, like help out on the football field. And she was a tour guide guide for all of the new members attending Penn State. Whenever you were in Ellen's presence, you just felt so warm and loved. And Ellen was also the type of girl where, as I said, she's super outgoing, she's super talkative. And so if she notices someone that isn't really talking or is a little bit shy, she would be the person to go up to them and spark a conversation with them and talk to them, which God bless these people because I personally am a very shy person and I don't usually like start conversations unless someone starts the conversation first. And so these types of people just make me feel so happy and loved. And that is exactly how Ellen was. And then after graduating college, that's when she went on to become a speech pathologist. But unfortunately, she didn't really like the field as much as she thought she would. And so that is when she decided to switch courses of her career and start taking night classes at Temple University to earn her teaching certifications to become a teacher. As she was earning her teaching certificate, Certificate at Temple University, that's when Ellen would meet Sam Goldberg at a party through mutual friends. Sam at this point in his life had been working for NBC for a couple years, but he also had a job at golf.com. Now it was said that when they first met up with each other, they hit it off immediately. They started talking and then after that they exchanged numbers and then shortly after that they began going on dates. They later on moved in with each other where both of them had successful jobs. Ellen at the time was still a speech pathologist but she also did teaching classes at night. And then as for Sam, he had the job at NBC, but also around this time, he had gotten a new job at golf.com. And Sam would even go on to propose to Ellen and the two of them became engaged. And so in the year of 2010, things were really looking up for Ellen. At this time, she had a teaching job at the Juanita Park Academy where she was a first grade teacher. She also just got engaged. So she was really excited about her wedding plans. Her and Sam actually planned planned on getting married in August at the Hershey Hotel. Overall, it seemed like Ellen's life was doing really, really well. She has her own apartment. She has a fiance. She has a new job that she absolutely loves because as I said, her personality is very bubbly and electric and that is the kind of personality you want as a teacher. She became a first grade teacher and all of the kids absolutely loved Ellen. There was also one teacher at the academy that said that typically whenever kids walk into the classroom and they see that they 
have a substitute for the day, they get a little excited because they're thinking we're going to stir up some trouble, maybe switch seats or do things that we're not supposed to. But whenever Ellen's kids walked into the classroom and saw that there was a substitute, they would get really sad and they would actually ask around to other teachers where Ellen was. Ellen absolutely loved her kids too. Ellen had even incorporated a little Pilates segment into her teachings for the day just to get her kids moving and in a good headspace for learning for the rest of the day. And so Ellen's life seems to be really going well for her at this point. And so that's why it was so out of the blue when one day Ellen would call her mom Sandy asking if she'd be able to move back home. And so Ellen's parents are a little bit confused as to why she wants to move back home, but Ellen just kind of gives very vague responses. She says that she's super stressed out at work and she just feels like she's overall not really in a good mental space. And so she feels like a change of scenery, like moving back home would be the best for her. And mind you, at the time, Ellen and Sam had lived in Pennsylvania while Ellen's parents still lived back home in Harrisburg, New York, which was five hours away. So if Ellen went to go move back home with her parents, this was a pretty big commitment. She would lose her job that she's worked so hard for. She would lose all of her friends that she's made out there through college and through her class. She would have to say goodbye to all of the kids that she loves so much. And on top of that, she would have to leave Sam because Sam didn't plan on moving all the way back to New York to be with Ellen. So this was kind of a very big decision for Ellen to make. And so her parents were very confused. And so Ellen's parents just told Ellen, you know, before making any big decisions, how about you go and see a psychiatrist and just to try to figure out her mental health before making a big decision like this so that in the future she doesn't regret it. And so Ellen did. She made an appointment with her psychiatrist where she would meet them three times on January 12th, January 17th, and January 19th of 2011. And the psychiatrist did indeed prescribe Ellen anti-anxiety medications where it took a couple of trial and errors, but once they figured out the right medication for her, it really started helping. She was first given Zoloft and then after that she was given a low dose of Xanax and then shortly after that she was given Ambien and Clonopin which ended up helping her. Sandy would say that during this time Ellen would frequently call Sandy saying how much better she felt, how the medications were really really helping her and she was finally getting her life back on track. She says that she now has a new motivation for life and a lust for life and before she wasn't really doing much of wedding planning because she had just been so depressed and didn't really have motivation to, but now on her new medication, she was getting back into wedding planning and she just overall felt so much better. And Ellen's parents were extremely happy for Ellen. And that same weekend, Ellen would actually go out and send out all of her save the date invitations for her and Sam's wedding. Also that same exact weekend, that's when Ellen was going to meet up with a friend at the mall because her friend was also getting married and Ellen was one of the bridesmaids. So they went out to go get their bridesmaids dresses. Now this friend would go on to say that usually Ellen is the type of person to always get dolled up. No matter what the occasion, she could just be going to the grocery store or out for a walk. Ellen was always the type of person that really took care in her physical appearance. She would always wear a little bit of makeup, she would always have her hair done, and she would always have on a cute outfit. But her friend would go on to say that on this specific day, Ellen did not look like her typical self. She had no makeup on, her hair was in a bun, and she was wearing sweatpants. Now there's nothing wrong with going out without makeup on or without your hair done or in sweatpants, but for Ellen, this was very odd. And so this friend picked up Ellen and realized how disheveled she looked, but Ellen just said that she was extremely tired because she didn't get much sleep last night. And so that's when the friend and Ellen went to the mall. And when they went to the mall, that's when they met up with all of the other bridesmaids to which all of the other bridesmaids would say the same exact thing about Ellen. And there was actually one point where all of the bridesmaids and the bride were in their dressing rooms putting on their dresses and the bride who was the friend that picked up Ellen noticed some soft crying going on in Ellen's room and so she knocks on the door and asks if she's okay and Ellen just comes out of the room and she starts bawling. She apologizes for crying and she says that and Ellen said quote I'm gonna get it together but her friend assured her you know you can talk to me about anything. I understand that we're all dress shopping and stuff, but you're still my friend and I wanna make sure that you're okay. But Ellen was like, no, 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 it's fine. Like, I'll be okay.
okay, this is your big day. You should be excited. Don't worry about me. And I didn't mention this earlier, but the reason why Ellen got the job at the Juanita Park Academy was because Sam's father actually worked at the school too. So that was the reason why Ellen was able to get into a really good teaching position. But Sam's father would go on to say that during this time, Ellen's workload was extremely overwhelming and there was just a lot of things going on at school. She was struggling trying to keep up with being a first time teacher. And that's why during this time she was very stressed out and disheveled, but her family would actually say the quite opposite. Ellen's family would actually go on to say that it had nothing to do with Ellen's workload at all. When Ellen would go back home to visit her parents, her dad would specifically say that there was something off about Ellen and that she wasn't her usual self. Even though at the time she was on her medications and she constantly told her mom Sandy that she was wonderful and she was doing great, whenever she would visit back home to her parents, she was a lot more anxious, a lot more nervous, and her father would also go on to say that Ellen would ask permission from Sam over things that she could have easily just decided herself. The dad would even go on to say, quote, something was amiss. Her personality was changed. She played it off like work was too much, but when the teacher who took over Ellen's classroom saw her books, said that everything was perfect. Hello everyone, don't worry, it's still me just thanking the sponsor of today's video, Shopify. Now, as a lot of you guys know, starting a business is not easy and it's 10 times harder when you have to do it alone. Good ideas always come from collaboration. And there's been a couple of partners in crime that have gotten it done, such as Watson and Holmes, Cagney and Lacey, the Hardy Boys. But what makes the perfect partner when it comes to growing your business? That is you and Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch your online shop stage to the real first life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you are selling sleuthing supplies or marketing mystery merch, Shopify helps you sell everywhere from their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person POS system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers and the internet's best converting checkouts up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. Shopify helps you sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. And I personally, add aside, like I really do love Shopify and genuinely every single person that I've met that does use Shopify have always said great things about them. I feel like Shopify compared to a lot of other large corporations genuinely really do care about their business owners. They're always staying really connected with their community and always giving back to their community. And I don't know, I just feel like that's one of the main things that I really look for in certain companies that I decide to put my services into. But you always want to just work with a company that is for you and by your side every step of the way. And I feel like Shopify really does do that. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US and Shopify's the global force behind Allbirds, Rothy's, and Brooklinen, and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash behind, and now grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash behind. Thank you once again, to Shopify for sponsoring today's episode. Now back to your episode. And then on January 26th, 2011, that's when Pennsylvania was hit with an insane winter blizzard. Ellen did indeed go into work that day at school, but was later sent home early due to the blizzard. And before going home at 1.26 p.m., she would stop to get gas. Shortly after Ellen came home, that's when Sam also arrived home because his work sent him home early as well due to the blizzard. And according to Sam, when he came home, Ellen was her usual self. She 
was laughing and smiling. They were conversating with one another. They were talking a little bit about wedding plans until around 4.30 when Sam decided to go downstairs to the apartment gym for a quick workout. As seen on security footage, Sam was seen entering the gym at 4.50 and then exiting about 30 minutes later at 5.30 before walking upstairs to his apartment. But when he went to go unlock the apartment door, he unfortunately couldn't because the swing latch from the inside was locked and the only person inside was Ellen. And so Sam starts banging on the door, yelling for her name, but he receives no response. Sam would go on to say that he continuously called and text Ellen trying to get the door open. And this was also confirmed by neighbors who heard Sam yelling Ellen's name through the door, but none of them walked outside of their rooms. They just kind of heard the yelling from inside their apartments. But although Sam said that he had called Ellen a bunch of times and texted her a bunch of times, later on when the police would look at his phone records, they found that he only texted Ellen nine times along with one email and did not call her once. And the text messages goes as follows. At 5.32 p.m., Sam sent, quote, hello, and then, quote, open the door. And after these messages, you know, the most uh, logical thing to do would be to call Ellen, because if you're trying to get into the apartment, it would only make sense to call the person inside of the apartment. But weirdly, he didn't even call Ellen. He called Ellen's mother to tell her that he couldn't get in the apartment, which, you know, Sandy was a little confused. She's like, okay, well, what do you want me to do about it? Like, I'm five hours away in New York. Maybe she's just in the shower or something. So the phone call between them two only lasted about three minutes until Sam would text Ellen again at 5.35 p.m. saying, quote, what are you doing? And then at 5.36 p.m. he says, quote, I'm getting pissed off. And then at 5.41 he says, quote, hello, with eight exclamation points. At 5.54 p.m., 13 minutes after he started knocking on the door, he says, quote, you better have a good excuse. And then in in that same minute at 554, he sends an email to Ellen where the subject of the email is quote open and then the email itself says quote the effing door. At 557 p.m. he writes another text saying quote what the F and ah with three exclamation points. After sending all of these text messages that's when Sam would walk downstairs and talk to the security guard on staff. Sam explains to the security guard that he was in his apartment with his girlfriend and then he went downstairs for a quick workout in the gym before going back upstairs. But now the door is locked and he can't get in and he can't get a hold of his girlfriend who's inside. So Sam then asked the security guard if he has one of those universal keys that open up all of the doors or if he has anything to open up the wing latch with. But this security guard says that he doesn't have that sort of key and he also doesn't have anything to break down the door with. But even if he did, he can't legally do do that. Like, that is very much illegal, and he can't help him break into his own apartment, but the security guard does tell Sam that if he does break down the door by his own free will, he will have to pay for any damages that he's created. And the security guard would also later on say that during this conversation, he looked down at Sam's shoes and noticed that Sam was wearing Timbaland boots. Now, if you remember, Sam just told the security guard that he just got back from the gym, and so so this was a little bit odd to the security guard because he was just thinking who wears Timberland boots at the gym and if he wasn't able to get back into his apartment then he didn't change his shoes in the process it wasn't anything major in the moment but it was a little bit odd and then after having this conversation one minute later Sam goes back in the elevator to go back up to his apartment and that's when he would text Ellen saying quote you have no idea. At 6.14 p.m., that's when Sam would make a call to his cousin named Camian. Now, Camian's dad was named James, so that's Sam's uncle, Uncle James. Remember that name because he's a very important person in this story. Sam makes a call to Camian, and this call lasts about six minutes. After that, he calls his uncle James, who is Camian's father. And then at 6.21 p.m., you see Sam back down in the lobby, sitting down on one of the couches as he's on the phone with James. James Schwartzman was actually a very famous judge in Pennsylvania, and he was on the ethics board and president of Pennsylvania Court of Judicial Discipline. So James was a very famous and highly educated lawyer. 
murder. So again, that's another reason why he's very important because why in the world would Sam call his uncle James before calling Ellen? Like it just, it makes no sense. And also why is he calling all of these outside sources? If he genuinely didn't think that anything was wrong with Ellen and maybe she was just sleeping or in the shower, why would he be calling everyone else but Ellen? And so then after Sam has this conversation with James, that's when he hangs up the phone and he goes up to the security guard once again and asks him if the security guard could accompany him while he goes and breaks down his own door. And the security guard obviously says no because this is his job. He literally has to stand by the door and keep tabs on who's coming in and coming out of the building. He can't just leave his post and he also reminds Sam that if he does break down the door, he's gonna pay for, he's gonna have to pay for any damages that he creates to the door. And so that's when Sam would go back upstairs and he would come back downstairs through the elevator several times to ask the security guard the same exact question, to basically ask him if he could please come upstairs and accompany him while he breaks down the door. All these several times, the security guard repeatedly tells him, no, I'm not going up there to accompany you before finally Sam just went on the elevator for the very last time. And you can see on security footage that Sam goes up there all by himself. Now, this is another really big key piece of evidence because Sam would later go on to tell the police and say in his police report that he was accompanied by a security guard when he broke down his door. And then at 6.31 p.m., that's when Sam was successfully able to break down the door. And when he walked inside the apartment, that is when he would find 27-year-old Ellen Greenberg lying on the kitchen floor, hunched over with a knife sticking out of her chest. Now, I do want to put a little warning before this police call. He does get a little bit graphic and detailed about how Ellen's body is, but I also want you to pay close attention to the tone of what he says and the very specific wording that he uses. I need, I need a I just, I just walked to my apartment. My fiance is on the floor with blood everywhere. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She, I don't know. I, I'm looking at her right now. She, I don't, I can't see anything. She didn't, there's nothing broken. She's bleeding. Ellie. You don't know where she's bleeding from. Can't Ellie. Where the blood's coming from. It's, I think her head. I think she hit her head. I think. I think but it's all everywhere. Okay, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. She might have fallen. Do you know yeah. what happened? She, she, she may have slipped his blood on the, on the table. Her, her face is a little purple. My, my, I just, my, I went downstairs to go work out. I came back up. The door was latched. My fiance's inside. She wasn't, she wasn't answering. So after about a half hour, I decided to break it down. I see her now just on the floor with blood. She's not, she's not responding. Okay. Is she breathing? She, I, <laughs> look at her chest. I need you to calm down. and I need you to look at her chest. It's really I don't think she, I really listen, don't think she is. Listen to me. Someone's on the way. Look at her chest. Is she flat on her back? I don't see her moving. Okay, do you know how to do CPR? I don't. Okay, I can tell you what to do, okay, until they get there. I want you to keep her flat oh, on her Oh, God. Back. Hello? Yeah, hi, okay. Are you willing to do CPR with me over the phone until they get I, there? I, I have to, right? Okay, so get her flat on her back, bare her chest, okay? You want to rip her shirt off. Okay, okay. I'm trying not to. I'm trying not to. Her shirt won't come off. It's a zipper. Rip oh, my off. God, she stabbed herself. Where? She fell with a knife. Oh, no, her knife's sticking out. Oh, uh, what? There's a knife sticking out of her heart. Oh, she stabbed herself? I, can't, I guess so. I don't know where she fell on it. I don't know. Okay, well, don't touch it. As you heard, the dispatcher tells Sam to start performing CPR, but then three minutes into the police call, he then realizes that there's a knife in Ellen's chest, which is very, very odd because if you're directed to give CPR and also the dispatcher was asking him, do you know where she's bleeding from? Like, do you know what's going on? He, for some reason, still doesn't see the obvious knife sticking out of her chest. I mean, if you discover the dead body of your girlfriend, wouldn't that be the first thing you find? There's also certain parts of the police call where at one moment he would be completely calm and cool and collected, but then the next moment he kind of goes into forced panic a little bit. Like he'll be explaining to the dispatcher everything going on and then very quickly change to an overly panicked state and be like, oh my God, Ellie, wake up, wake up 
pick up and then just go back to like normal conversation with the dispatcher. It again feels like he's forcing the sound of panic so it doesn't make him look too suspicious. Also, another really odd thing that Sam says is that when he's talking about the knife, he assumes that Ellen had stabbed herself, not thinking that maybe someone had broken in and stabbed her because what sense would it make for Ellen to do something like this to herself? And since the door was locked, there could be the possibility of the person who killed her in the apartment. But he didn't think about any of that weirdly. He just assumed that she did it herself. Kind of like he was trying to set up the story for the police. The police call was made at 6.31 p.m. and paramedics were dispatched at 6.33 p.m. And then at 6.34 p.m., that's when a man that looked like Sam's cousin enters the apartment building and goes upstairs to Sam's apartment. Now, I say a person that looks like Sam's cousin, Kamian, I'm referring to, because later on, Sam's family would come out and say that that wasn't Kamian. It was just a guy that looked like him. And then shortly after this Kamian lookalike entered the building, two minutes later, that's when paramedics showed up. Now, as the police and paramedics investigated the crime scene, automatically when they walked into the apartment, there were things really off about the scene. On the counter was a knife block that was tipped over, and then right next to it was a cutting board with chopped blueberries and half of an orange, as if Ellen was in the middle of making herself a little snack before all this happened. Ellen was found on the floor of the kitchen with her back hunched over, so all of her weight was kind of pushing her forward, her head was down, and her feet were extended out in front of her, which is once again kind of an odd position for Ellen to be in because once again, the dispatcher had asked Sam multiple times, where are the wounds? Where is the bleeding coming from? What's wrong with her? Even the little touch of like her shoulder or something like that, she would have fallen over, but she didn't. So it kind of seemed like Sam didn't even go near her at all. Lying next to Ellen was a pair of glasses and in her left hand was a clean white towel. Why would she have a clean white towel right next to her when there's blood surrounded all over her on the floor, on her clothes, and then randomly she just has this towel in her hand that's completely clean. Paramedics also took note that her stab wounds actually went through her clothing because she was wearing a zip-up sweater. So this, again, doesn't seem like something that someone would do to themselves. Police peeked around and noticed that this could not have been a break-in because there were valuables just lying all over the house, such as, for example, Sam's laptop was fully open and just out on the kitchen island. There was also Ellen's laptop in the bedroom on the floor, as well as her business laptop on her desk. Ellen's engagement ring was also just sitting on her nightstand, which is kind of odd because as I said, these two were engaged. And so why wouldn't Ellen be wearing her engagement ring? But paramedics bring Ellen's body to the hospital for autopsy. And that's when they would find that Ellen was not just stabbed once, but she was stabbed 20 times. There were some stab wounds on the back of her head, a huge gash on the top of her head, stabs on the back of her neck, her chest, her upper stomach, and the knife that was still in the left side of her chest. She also had bruises all over her body in different stages of healing, meaning these bruises happened over a long period of time. These bruises were found on her legs, her right arm, and her abdomen. And according to medical examiners, due to the pattern, the severity, and the number of bruises, these bruises suggested repetitive physical altercations. And these weren't just average bruisings, because I know that there's a lot of people that bruise easily. I myself even bruise easily, but a lot of my bruises usually happen like on my legs or my arms. I don't think it's really that common to just find random bruises on yourself when it comes to like your chest or your stomach or your side. The medical examiners even described her injuries as someone who was in contact sports like football or soccer. And immediately when the police arrived on scene, they knew that there was no way this was a suicide. And it was definitely something more than that because the police officers had actually called up backup to the scene. And so when the backup arrived, police officers went downstairs to kind of fill in the backup officers about what was going on. And one of the officers said to the other, quote, you've got a murder upstairs. 
upstairs. And at one point, Sam's uncle James even showed up to the scene and demanded to go upstairs, to which he was obviously denied because there was an active crime scene. It was also said by residents that they had seen Sam walking out of the building in handcuffs and he was yelling at the security guard that he was talking to earlier, quote, tell them I didn't do this, tell them I didn't do this. And that's when Sam was dragged out of the building in handcuffs and was sent to the station for further questioning. But unfortunately, Sam was able to get out of it pretty quickly and was released that same exact day. The next day, Sam's uncle James had called the apartment building and asked if he could go up there to get one of Sam's suits for Ellen's funeral. And now the receptionist said, I'm not really sure if you're allowed to do that because there was a crime scene up there less than 24 hours ago there's still blood all over the place like it's not even cleaned up that's when the receptionist asks her boss about you know like can we let this guy just go up there and the boss actually said she spoke to the police and the police technically weren't responsible for the cleanup and so they called a company called crime scene cleanup that was being sent out to clean up the place before james went inside but the manager basically told the receptionist once it's all clean up there, yeah, he can go up there. He can do whatever he wants up there. He can just like grab whatever he needs and go. And so the receptionist said to James, you know, we need to get the place cleaned up first, but after it's cleaned up, then you can come and get whatever you need to get. But this receptionist had a really bad feeling about this. And so after the company had cleaned up everything, that's when she went upstairs and she recorded a video of the entire apartment and what it looked like before James went there because she just had a gut feeling that something else was going on and she was a hundred percent right because when James showed up to the apartment he did not just grab Sam's suit but he also took Sam's laptop Ellen's business laptop Ellen's personal laptop and Ellen's phone and so the day after this the receptionist showed this footage to the police the police were able to get a search warrant for the uncle's home and retrieved all of the belongings and this is insanely suspicious because behavior coming from James, who, mind you, is a very well-educated lawyer. Why in the world would James have any business getting Ellen's laptop, personal laptop, and her phone? And just because Ellen is dead, that doesn't give him any right to any of her things. He's a lawyer. He should know this was not a good idea, and this could definitely look bad on him. When the medical examiners did the autopsy, they ruled this as a homicide, because if you look at the 3D atomical diagram of all of her stab wounds, there are stab wounds on the back of her neck, as well as a huge gash on the top of her head. And these are all things that you cannot do just by yourself. And so it was ruled as a homicide. But the very next day, the medical examiner in charge, Dr. Osborne, he didn't deem it as a homicide, but instead ruled it as suspicious they literally did that. They said, oh, it's not a homicide. It's just suspicious whatever that means. And what's even weirder is that Ellen's family was going through the worst through this because when her parents found out that their only daughter had passed away in the most brutal way possible, this was traumatizing and really, really hard for them to go through. And what made it 10 times harder is that when Sandy and Josh, every time they would get a lawyer or a public defender, all of these lawyers and public defenders were not able to get any access to any information information regarding the case. They weren't given access to police reports. They weren't even given access to Sam's interrogation footage. So it seemed like the police were actively trying to help Sam get out of whatever he did to Ellen. And then on February 18th, 2011, three weeks after the murder, that's when Dr. Osborne changed the cause of death from suspicious to suicide. The doctor said that he later on did indeed change it to suicide after having meetings with the district attorney offices, officers, and his boss and the chief medical examiner. He said that after he was given more time to analyze everything, assess the situation, given access to crime scene photos, as well as her medical history, he deemed this as a suicide because Ellen was currently on anti-anxiety medications and had been visiting with a psychiatrist. Once again, Ellen only saw the psychiatrist 
three times and she was given some anxiety medication. Like Ellen was in the process of bettering herself. She wanted more for herself. She wanted to get better. And so why in the world would she do something as brutal as this to herself? There was actually one doctor in specific that said that one of the stab wounds found on Ellen went through her spine and to her brain. And something as powerful as this is not something that Ellen from her size, weight, and strength could do by herself. And even the stab in general is so painful, it would be unbearable for Ellen to continue stabbing herself. And so this is a complete slap in the face to the family because the family knows that this is not a suicide and Sam definitely has something to do with this, but he's just being let off as if nothing happened. And so the family, sort of at a loss at this point, they decide to get an independent autopsy done on Ellen's body. Her name was Dr. Adams and the parents of Ellen, Sandy and Josh, specifically remember speaking with Dr. Adams and telling her everything that's going on, asked for the independent autopsy. But... After all of this happened, Dr. Adams would go on to gaslight the entire family and just straight up say that she never did the autopsy, that she has no recollection of it, she doesn't remember, and she doesn't even remember meeting with her parents. Ellen's parents' lawyer tried to argue with Dr. Adams, and she just continues to say that she has no recollection of it. Not that she didn't do it, but that she only just has no recollection of it. And so the lawyer is saying, okay, well, if you don't remember it, then clearly you did it and you were paid for that day, I'm assuming. So where's your payment stub from that day? Like, how did you get paid for that day? But Dr. Adams refused to give the lawyer any sort of her payment documents, which again is so weird. It seems as if as soon as the family is so close to getting answers, something happens where it sort of halts all of the their answers and people just kind of bypass it. There was also a famous criminal pathologist by the name of Cyril Rett who worked on cases such as the John F. Kennedy assassination, John Benet Ramsey, and when he was reviewing specifically Ellen's case, he would go on to say that he's never seen anything like this before and he cannot wrap his head around how this could be a suicide. And another famous forensic scientist by the name of Henry Lee who has worked on cases like the O.J. Simpson trial, he would go on to say that the number of wounds and the type of blood patterns are similar to a homicide and her death should at least be undetermined, not a suicide. He also noted from crime scene photos that although Ellen was found in the kitchen hunched over and sitting upright, she actually had some dried up blood that dripped from her nose to the side of her ear, meaning that at some point she would have been lying down and she was also laying down for long enough for the blood to dry. And he also noted that this is a very odd way for Ellen to off herself. Usually, especially in women, women who do commit suicide usually do not use a method of stabbing because stabbing someone is the slowest and most painful way to die. Especially stabbing yourself in the back of the neck or on the top of the head, it simply just doesn't make sense. And unfortunately, even to this day in 2024, Ellen's family is still fighting to get the autopsy changed and re examine. The medical examiner's offices say in response to all of this that due to lack of defense wounds and the door latch, the medical examiner's office shouldn't be legally pressured to change their professional and considered determination. And even after 12 years, medical examiners refuse to look into Ellen's case. A lot of the officers on this case like to use Ellen's one text that she sent to her mother, Sandy, where she was starting her new medications, and she said, quote, I'm starting the meds. I know you don't understand, but I can't keep but I can't keep living and feeling this way. And then a couple days after this message was sent, about 10 days later, that's when Ellen would send a follow-up text message to her mom that she feels so much better on her new medication, she has a new motivation and a lust for life, and her mom was pretty proud of her and was responding with super happy and encouraging text messages. But for some reason, the police love to use that little text message that she sent as a way to make her sound suicidal, even though she wasn't 
suicidal. She never said that she was suicidal. Even her psychiatrist came out to the media and said that she was not suicidal. She just had anxiety. And for some reason, police and medical examiners love to use that little text as a way to say that, you know, she had been planning something like this for a while. And back in 2020, Ellen's parents actually attempted at suing the Philadelphia County Medical Examiner's Office and Marion Osborne, who was the former medical examiner on the case, which currently the lawsuit is still undergoing. And as of today in 2024, Ellen's parents are still fighting for justice for Ellen and to get her autopsy re-examined and changed. And yeah, that is the end of today's case. If you guys found this case interesting, make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day today. Make sure to be safe out there. Go outside a little bit today. It's starting to get springtime, which means the weather is gorgeous now. So go on your little hot girl walk. And as always, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I will see you guys next week. Bye.